May the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dearly loved disciples of Jesus, who is the first and the last, the living one, the one who is dead but, look, is alive forever and ever, the one who holds the keys to death and Hades. You've no doubt heard the expression, the, the misquote that we are addressing this morning. If, if Perhaps you've even used it. They're in a better place. Oh, I suppose we usually say he's in a better place or she's in a better place. And, and th that phrase, that quote is, is spoken most often if not exclusively, when we're speaking to people who have lost a loved one. And, and as with many of the misquotes that we've addressed over the last several weeks, I, I think they arise sometimes, they, they, they sort of get formed in some of our efforts not to be trite. In other words, we're striving not to say the same thing in the same way all the time. We want it to sound fresh. But what happens when we leave the map of God's word and go off the map is we often don't get it right. And we say things that are not true. It's either that or we're really trying to mask or be cryptic about what we really want to say. And our God does not want his children to lie or to be cryptic. He wants us to be honest. He wants us to tell the truth. He wants us to be straightforward with people. So for that reason, I'm going to encourage you, urge you, not to use the phrase, they're in a better place. Because here's why. If someone is mourning the loss of a loved one who had no relationship with Jesus. In other words, they were an unbeliever. Then to go and say to that grieving loved one, whether a believer or unbeliever, they're in a better place, is just a gross lie. On the other hand, if you're attempting to comfort someone whose loved one who is a believer died, someone who had a relationship with Jesus, and you say to them, they're in a better place. You have just proclaimed a gross understatement. And for that reason, it's a misquote. It's not true. And we're going to look at that a little more. We're going to dig down on those, those two expressions and why one's a gross lie and the other's a gross understatement. The one is a gross lie because those who go, those who die without faith, those who die without a relationship with Jesus, do not go to a better place. Yes, the bodies of all the dead go to the ground. That's what the Bible tells us. The ashes go back to the dirt, right, where they came from. But the soul of those who did not believe are kept by God in the dungeon that's been prepared for the punishment of the devils. We call it hell. They go to hell. And hell is in no way a better place than where we are now. On the other hand, those people who have died and had a faith relationship with Jesus, who had put their faith in him, do not simply go to a better place. That's a gross understatement. Why? Well, that, just think about that. If their loved one had been wrestling with cancer for the last several days or, or weeks or months or maybe even years before they died, and you simply say, well, they're in a better place, that could simply mean, well, at least they're not suffering anymore. That doesn't, that doesn't say anything about where they are. and that's, that's so far away from what's true, the reality, that it doesn't help at all. They're not in a better place. They're in the best place. They're in a place that, that is so beyond what we can describe. They're in heaven. 
their souls are kept with Christ in heaven. So, hell is what? Hell is worse than we can imagine. There aren't words to describe it, because it falls outside anything in our human experience, as far as bad goes. But on the other hand, heaven is greater than we can imagine. I've often used this illustration when speaking to people about hell and about heaven. You, if you are aware that your creator, the one who knit you together in your mother's wounds, knows all the nerve endings in your body and in your mind and in your soul, and if he should touch them to in, in give you pain all at the same time, boom, right? You, you couldn't even imagine the kind of pain that would be. That's hell. Because hell is where God punishes those who did not have faith in Jesus, who rejected his love. On the other hand, that same God and creator who knit you together and who knows where all the, your nerve endings are in body, mind, and soul, when he wants to bless you all at the same time and, and make you feel that joy in his presence, why, that's also mind-blowing, isn't it? You can imagine how good that would be? Paul says, nope, we can't imagine it. He says in Romans chapter 8, he said, our present suffering, the pain we're enduring, isn't worth comparing. In other words, you cannot compare it to the glory that is going to be revealed in us and to us when we see God in heaven. In other words, it is incorrect to say that heaven is as good as earth or hell is bad. That is false. Heaven is greater than that even. Wow, isn't that something? That God has prepared a place like that for those who love him, who have a relationship with his son Jesus. So, I suppose we could put an amen there. And you now know why we should say they're, not, they're in a better place. We don't want to say that. What we want to say is, if their people have died, they've lost a loved one, and the loved one didn't have a relationship with Jesus, then I can't imagine a scenario where I could tell them the truth and do as God requires and, and say that in love. I couldn't say to someone who's grieving. I can't even think of a, a, a scenario where I would. Well, you know, your, per, your loved one's in hell. Why, that would be the most cruel thing you could say to somebody. You, it's the truth, but it's not spoken in love, is it? And so what do you say to someone who's lost a loved one who doesn't, that you know isn't in heaven with Jesus? I think the best thing you can say is simply tell them that you grieve the loss with them. And, 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 and then offer any help, be of service to them in any way. And maybe later, you will, God will give you the opportunity to witness to them and to tell them what God has prepared for them through faith in Jesus. On the other hand, if, if someone has lost a loved one and they, went, and they had a relationship with Jesus, why they haven't lost them? You can just say, simply say, they live with Jesus, right? They're with Jesus. Now, how do you know that? How can you be certain of this? Well, if I just put an amen right now, you go, okay, we got it, pastor. Don't say the other. We're going to say this now. I, I've, I've failed you as a pastor, and I haven't done a very good job as a minister or a messenger of the gospel. Because it's important you know why that is true. It's important that you be able to say why that is true. You need to be as confident and convinced of it as I am. And so we, while we could turn to any number of passages in our Bibles to, to give us that reason, I'd like to go to Romans chapter 6. Now I'm going to give you some background to Romans chapter 6. At the last part of chapter 5, Paul has declared that the grace of God goes far beyond, it is higher, wider, deeper than any human sin. It all together, than all human sin. He said where, where sin abounds, where it just increased. Grace went far beyond that. Well, that's good news. But Paul anticipates a misguided question, or, or questions. He said, well, someone's probably going to ask. Well, if that's true, Paul, then shouldn't I go on sinning? Why, that would make God's grace look even greater. If people know that God's grace covers a sinner as I am, and I'm a really bad sinner, why then they'll appreciate God's grace all the more, won't they? 
Or, or maybe I should just keep on sinning because it doesn't matter because God's grace covers, right? And now you hear Paul's answer to that question in Romans chapter 6. You have it written in your, in your worship folders there. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. I, I don't want you to miss the point of what Paul is saying here in Romans 6. The point is this, that baptized Christians don't think about how to sin. They don't entertain how close they can possibly tiptoe to the line of God's law without crossing. Christians don't think that way. He says, don't you know, right? are you still ignorant of this, that those of us who have been baptized, those of us who have had, have a relationship with Jesus through faith in him, why we've put that away. That, those thoughts died in us. And we don't live in those thoughts anymore. But that's, the, that's his line of thinking there. And the, 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 his reason for that then becomes the nitty gritty of these, these verses. And it's in that nitty gritty of the verses that we will discover the reason why we can be certain of what happens to us and our loved ones who die in faith. So, he's saying, when you were baptized, God joined you to Jesus. He joined you to Jesus' death, to his burial, and to his resurrection. A resurrection which, by the way, was not just a re resurrection of his soul, but of his body and soul. So, when God looks at you, he now sees Jesus. Because you have been baptized into Christ. Now that's great news. Especially for me, for a sinner like me. I, I commit so many sins, I cannot even count them. I'm ashamed of them. But I know that I bear the guilt and the responsibility of, of paying or, or suffering the punishment for those sins. But Paul is telling me that, that when I was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when I was baptized into Christ, I was so intimately joined to Christ that I was joined to his suffering and death. Aaron the sinner was crucified with Christ on the cross. Though I didn't suffer, Christ suffered for me. But I'm so closely joined that God says I died. And then I was buried. That old Aaron, that old rascally sinner was, was buried with Christ and he's dead. And God's not going to go trying to dig him up again. However, as Paul then points out, Christ also rose from the dead through the glory of the Father. And just as Christ was raised to life, body and soul, so also a new Aaron was raised to life in body and soul. And, and that's now how I live. I'm the new Aaron. I'm the saint. I'm the little Christ. Because that's what it means to be a Christian. A little Christ. I love to do the things that God wants me to do. I, I 
think about all the ways I can give glory to him in all the opportunities he gives me to show love to him and to others. And not only do I think about these things, I actually do them. I am the perfect child that God wants me to be. That's what he says. That's how he sees me because I have been baptized into Christ. Now, to be fair to the con wider context here in Romans, there's still this old Aaron. He's, he's dead, but he, I, the, the new Aaron's got to drag him along. Like that, huh? That new, Aaron, that, that new Aaron is being dragged down by the old Aaron. And that old Aaron is a unconverted, reprobate, reprobate, rascally sinner. All he thinks about is how he can do everything God doesn't want him to do. And so though the new Aaron is alive and he's struggling, that old rascally old Aaron keeps dragging him and slowing him down. And and the only way to deal with that old Aaron is, is for me to, to take him back to the waters of baptism and hold him under until the bubbles stop. Right? To hold him under, to kill that old... Now, how do you do that? Well, you do that through daily sorrow over sin. Confessing your sins and trusting that what God did for you in baptism is true for you. He washed away those sins. He destroyed that old rascally sinner. And in those waters, the new Aaron rose again. And when I trust that, I can live that way. Now, that's, why it, that's what explains then why you and those who love and live most closely with me don't always see me the way God sees me. Nevertheless, I am baptized. I have been joined inseparably to Christ in his death death and his burial and yes even in his resurrection I have been raised from the dead already that's what God has told me in baptism do you see how certain my resurrection at the last day is why God says he's already done it but you know that's not just true for me that is true of every single one of you who have been baptized and who have a faith relationship with Jesus. You, the old you, has died and been buried with Christ. And a new you, body and soul, has been raised and glorified, who now lives before God. And, and that then is how we think, how we speak, and how we live. That's just wonderful good news, isn't it? You, you, you might be saying, well, wait a minute, Pastor. I, I, I think you're probably reading too much into those words of St. Paul. Does it really mean that I have the hope of the resurrection? Is he really talking about my physical resurrection from the dead? Well, what did Jesus say? Just a few verses after the ones I read in our gospel lesson today, Jesus addressed Martha. Martha had just confessed, Lord, I know Lazarus will be raised at the last day. Well, that's a remarkable faith, isn't it? She trusted her Old Testament scriptures that told her, like we read in Psalm 16, that God wasn't going to let her, stay, his, her, her brother stay in the grave. He was going to raise his, her brother at the last day. But Jesus doesn't say, okay, that's good, Martha. I'm glad to hear that. Now where's Mary? Not what he said. You remember what he said? He said, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Notice he didn't say, Martha, I'm the one who points to the resurrection. I'm the one who points to life. Or, Martha, I'm the one who will give you life, and I'm the one who will raise Lazarus. He doesn't say that. He says, Martha, I am resurrection, and I am life. And now listen to how he continues, so you can't mistake this. He said, whoever believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Those are Jesus' clear and certain words. A few months ago, we, we studied Revelation chapter 20, remember? 
Do you remember what happens to the, to the believers who die no matter how, whether, whether they die natural, from natural causes, we would say, or from, or from persecution and their bodies are mutilated? Well, what happens to them? Jesus tells us plainly, they, they're alive and they're living and ruling with Christ in heaven. That's where they are. So I'm not reading too much into these words of Paul, am I? Paul is echoing those words of Jesus. So it's important that we don't say, or don't tell lies and, and half-truths and things like that. We won't say they're in a better place. Rather, for those whose loved ones have had a relationship with Jesus, even though they die, they live. They still have that relationship with Jesus. Even though you die, you will live because you have a relationship with the one who is resurrection, who is life. That rat relationship was established at baptism. So tell people the truth. Always do that in love. So what do we tell people? Tell them this. Tell them that their loved ones live with Christ. They are alive. They are with Jesus in heaven. Because that's the truth. The one who promised it does not lie to us. Believe it and then unashamedly and confidently tell it. Let's pray, shall we? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word to us over the last several weeks. You have certainly corrected some of our wrong thinking and saying. We appreciate this. We thank you also that you have led us into scriptural wisdom and truth. And you have told us the things that we need to tell other people. We ask that you would remind us of your word. And that you would give us the courage to speak it. But then always the love to speak it in love to those who need to hear it. And we ask then that you would bless our witness as we speak the truth in love. Thank you for your gifts in baptism, for joining us all to you through faith and baptism, so that we have been buried with you through baptism into death, and now also raised with you by the glory of the Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Now may the peace of God that goes beyond all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.